Zation company founded in 2021 will also provide consulting services. And at the beginning, and this is still an activity we have in place, we found ourselves through proprietary trading and some MEV. And so the subject of this talk is to discuss how we implemented in uh, 2021 an AMM back running uh, Awesome. Box. So since then, there have been some major changes, but uh, I still believe there's a lot of information which could be useful for you from uh, this uh, presentation. Let's go. Okay. Um, so uh, what we speak about today is first, we'll um, speak about AMM arbitrage in general before focusing on the board architecture and uh, then focus on each of the sub components to give you a hands-on approach of how this kind of uh, arbitrage board can be implemented in practice. So first, as you know, in traditional finance, um, we have market maker, which are professional actors which pro who provide liquidity between assets. And so what they usually do is that they quote a price both at the bid uh, when buying and uh, when selling, so what we call at the ask. And they make a profit in the difference between the bid price and the ask price, which is called uh, the spread. And in uh, DeFi, the major innovation of the summer of 2020 was the advent of automated market maker. In fact, this is what launched the DeFi uh, summer. And th these are smart contracts which are always willing to quote a price between a set of assets. So, in the difference with traditional finance where market makers are active, here we have an automated and passive setup when we can just LP into a smart contract and be providing uh, liquidity. So the two most popular protocols at, at the time and still are were Uniswap and Balancer and first Uniswap V2. And as you know, in Uniswap V2, we have a smart contract which provides liquidity between a pair of uh, crypto assets along an invariant formula. And so if we denote X and Y, respectively the balance of the smart contract in both tokens, then there is this invariant which must always uh, remain true, which is that the product of the quantity of both uh, tokens must remain constant. And so using this uh, basic invariant, we can uh, obtain the output amount when you send some uh, tokens into a smart contract. So you can compute how much you get of the token B when you send token A into the smart contract. And you can also obtain the swap price, which can which is obtained as how much you pay divided by how much you get. And so using this formula here, we did use the swap price is equal to the ratio of how much input token you have into the smart contract divided by how much output token you have within the smart contract, which is the marginal price for a zero size swap. Okay. So this means that um, basically when you trade a very small quantity, this is the instantaneous price that you get. Plus another factor, which at the first order is equal to the input divided by the reserve output. Okay. So uh, that ba basically um, what we have done here is that we computed the swap price at the first order. So with a linear impact. So uh, in truth, the impact is more than linear. So you have also qu quadratic terms which appear uh, here. But uh, for small uh, for small traders, this is um, accurate enough. And so what happens when you trade is that you displace yourself on this curve, which, which um, describes the x, y, equal k invariant uh, function. Okay, so at the beginning, let's say you are here, then you trade, you will be, uh, come here. And when you divide the difference x prime div uh, minus x divided by y prime minus y, you get the obtained swap price. Okay. Awesome so, stuff, bro. Um, this was the first example of, a of AMM, uh, which is Uniswap uh, V2. And it, this has been uh, generalized in uh, Balancer, 
where they took this two asset pool and generalized it for n assets. So instead of having just a product of two tokens balance, which is equal to a constant, we have a product with more than two tokens, which is still equal to, um, to a constant. And in fact, what we have here is that uh, we can weigh the influence of each token by a factor, which is the weight of the token within the, the pool. Okay. So in fact, what we are here describing is this is, has been uh, shown into the balance uh, white paper is that we are, uh, we are the invariance, so the constant is some sort of the geometric mean of the token balance of all the tokens which makes the liquidity pool. So I'm spending a little bit of time here on this, but uh, this is important because this is how you can obtain the impact function and the prices you get. And so this is how, you, at the end of the day, you compute uh, how you do the arbitrage. Okay. And so now the exchange awesome. formula, instead of just being reserve inputs div divided by reserve outputs plus uh, this factor, you, you now get something which has an exponent here, yeah? which depends on the difference of, of, the, of the weights of the input token and the output token. And in the case of uh, Uniswap, you just have the weight of the output token, which is equal to the weight of the input token. So you should find the same formula than the, the one you had uh, before. Okay. So this being said, let's focus now on the four types of arbitrage that you can do when interacting uh, with AMM. And so here they are ranked from the most aggressive to the less aggressive. So the most aggressive, the one uh, which is most known, is front running or sandwiching. So in traditional markets, this is uh, illegal. Okay, so here what you do is that uh, when you have one guy who wants to pass a significant, a significant trade, let's say buying one hundred thousand dollars of links, detect it into the mempool. You buy the coins before him, thus increasing the price. He buys it at an inflated price, and then you sell the token just after him. So what you have done here is that you extracted value of from the unwilling uh, buyer. Then you have a sniping, which consists into buying new coins as soon as they are listed. You have back running, which is when you arbitrage price inefficiencies within AMM, which have been created by previous traders. So here, instead of going before the trader, you come after him. So instead of front running, you back run. And then you have just in time liquidity where you detect in the mempool that there is a big trade and you provide liquidity for it. Okay. And uh, you wow. have liquidity just before the big trade, you provide liquidity for the trade. One question. And you withdraw the liquidity just after the trade. One so, question, bro, for yes. you is, uh, is, I never heard about just-in-time liquidity. Can you talk a little bit about this? So we're talking about watching a big trade and, and providing liquidity really fast and then taking the liquidity out with the fees and everything still worth it? Yeah, uh, exactly. For big enough trades, uh, it's worth it, but uh, I'm uh, really big trades. So for small trades, it's not worth it. But when you have one guy who is aping uh, several millions in one single transactions, it's it's worth it. Also, depending on the gas fees, uh, etc. Awesome and stuff. So there has been a post I have seen on Twitter um, recently of how you can use a mix of front running and uh, just in time liquidity to extract the maximum value. Because when you front run, you extract value from the buyer, and when you use just in time liquidity, you extract value from the other liquidity provider because you take the fees instead of them. Okay, and so when you use a mix of the both, uh, this is a way to extract the maximum value out of a single trade. But this is not the topic of uh, today's uh, talk. Today is about back running. Let's go. So how you can detect inefficiencies within IMM and arbitrage. Okay, so this is not aggressive. Okay, so this is just you know some guy he change the price, he created an inef inefficiencies, and so you arbitrage it back. Whereas front running, you know, there is a bit of a moral dilemma here because, you know, in, in traditional finance, this is uh, illegal. Okay. 
And so we'll focus on back run, implementing a back running algorithm on Ethereum. And this was done, you know, at the beginning of 2021. So it was pre EIP 1559. So it was at the time there were gas tokens and it was before Flashbots, which was launched, I think, in March or April. And so here the idea is very simple is that we are starting from the set of all uh, trading pairs, which we represent as a graph. So let's say <laughs> here we are representing all the trading pairs of, on Uniswap. You can trade from WETH to WBTC, from WETH to USDC, from USDT to USDC, but not USDC to Tron, but you can uh, trade from WBTC to Tron and USDT to Tron. This is uh, an illustrative example. And so we are building a graph which represents all the IMM pairs. And so you notice that the uh, vertex of the graphs are the pairs and the edges are the uh, IMM, are the nodes. Okay. And so the idea of finding an arbitrage here is finding a, a cycle which yields a, pro a positive profit. Okay. So for instance, maybe if I uh, sell WETH to WBTC and then I sell my WBTC to Tron and then Tron to USDT and the USDT to WETH, I can obtain a profit because uh, the market is uh, not very efficient. And, and the nice thing about it is that as I end where I started, well, I can do it with a flash swap. So I do not need to mobilize any capital. Because when I do, uh, for instance, front running, I need to mobilize uh, capital. I cannot do it with a, with a, a flash swap. Whereas here, I need zero capital to do this. And so, so in order to do this, what we need to do is we need to compute all the possible trades. And so one trade is a uh, cycle. We need to compute the output of a cycle giving, given a, a specific input. So here in this cycle here, what do I obtain when I input one uh, WETH? What do I obtain when I input X WETH? We need to find the maximum for each cycle, then find the best cycle, and then we execute. Okay, and please don't hesitate to cut me if uh, anything is... Uh, yeah, yeah, one, one okay, question so that I have for focus. you is when you say that... Uh, so you're going to use flash swaps, right? To get the money and all you need to do is have enough to pay the fee yeah. in the end. And, and one question is regarding computing possibilities with the amount of pairs we have today on Uniswap, it seems a little bit like a, you know, um, complicated task in the sense that there's a lot of computing. At the same time, I saw some people using Reef and REVM to do these things like massively fast. Do you have any inputs on that? Well, uh, in fact, uh, le uh, the later part of the presentation focuses on the optimization you can do to reduce complexity. So at the time, we were computing about 15 million possibility within one block. Okay, so wow. basically what you want to do is that you want to optimize your computing power, and at, at the same time, you'd want to avoid doing useless computations. So you want to reselect which cycles, you know, have a better chance of um, yielding a profit so that uh, you don't waste computing power or, on useless cycles. So for instance, if you see that there is a pair, there is no money in it, or it is very lowly connected, so it does not have you know many possibility going through it, obviously, uh, you, you may think that uh, this pair is less in interesting and so you'll uh, um, spend less computing power on it or even ex exclude it from your set. Okay. And so this is uh, what we do here. So at the time, the ETH block chain was a bit random. And so here, and uh, you just asked a very important question. We focus on, compu on computing, you know, very complicated stuff. So we find a lot of uh, arbitrage which are, which are complicated. So with a cycle length of five, six, seven points. And so our reference time is to be included into the next block because there are two ways you can do back running, right? Either you can be the fastest possible on earth. And so you arbitrage the transaction while it is still into, in the mempool. So you get the um, placed as the next transaction after the one which created the price discrepancy. 
And so you need to be extremely fast. You know, it, it is in a matter of a few milliseconds. Or you can focus on uh, having more complex as possibility at the ex expense of speed. And in this case, the, what is important is not to be included into the same block as a transaction which created the discrepancy, but to be included into the next block. Okay, and so you have more time, but when you do this, then you are in competition with, with uh, all the other which uh, who are also doing it. And so this is where a PGA or price gas option comes into place because you want to be the first one with this ID into the block. And so here, uh, this bot focuses on uh, finding complicated uh, arbitrage. And so here the flow is quite simple. Okay, so first we begin by getting all possible pairs, so Uniswap, Ushiswap, Balancer. We then have to sanitize the graph. Okay, so here we compute a graph of all possible, you know, trades, but we need to ensure that it is healthy enough. So there are a few algorithms to do this. We then need to update the balance of the pair, so to have the price of each token into each of the pair. We then need to get all possible passes. We then optimize it. So we need to find the output of a cycle given an input and find the maximum for each cycle, possible trade. And depending on the result, we execute. Okay. And, and when we execute, we need to interact with the mempool. And at the time, there were considerations such as the gas token and the efficiency raise. I won't spend too much time on it because it's this history now, but it is a uh, also interesting to see how was the competitive uh, landscape uh, at the time. So first, let's begin by uh, the first subcomponent. Sub uh, so we need to get the pairs from Uniswap and SushiSwap from Balancer and to update the pair balance. So this can be done in half a second to one second. And then you optimize, which is also done in half a second to 1.5 seconds. But now what I will focus on is the graph sanity part, which is once I have gotten all the pairs by interacting, let's say, with the routers of Uniswap V2 in Swap V3, how do I compute a nice graph? Okay. And so here, the problem, as you were saying, is that we, got, we now got a lot of pairs, so about 30K at the time. And so this will make too much pa passes for us to be efficient in our computation. Plus, we also have the problems that some pairs are not valid because there is no money in it, or that they are referencing scam tokens. And so we need to cleanse our graph. Okay. And so this is done through the graph sanity model, which is uh, which are describing now. And so first, we can we construct an optimistic an optimistic graph of all tokens and pairs. Okay. And so that we can rank all the pairs and all the tokens by how connected they are. And obviously, what you have here is that if you have one token which is only connected to one other token, then you know that no arbitrage will go through it. Because um, when you do an arbitrage, you have to find a cycle, which is you have to end at the same place you started. And so if there is one token which is alone, as you cannot go through an IMM and come back, you know you will never go through this token. Okay, so this is the first part of the cleansing operation. You remove all the lowly connected tokens which you will never use. Okay, and then we need to compute like an estimated value of each um, of each pair. And for this, we use a breadth first search uh, algorithm. Okay, so here. What we are doing basically is here. Is this starting with this graph? Okay, we start from WETH, which is our reference uh, token. Okay, and here what we do is that we are constructing our graph of the value of all the tokens start by assuming that WETH has a value of one. So, first, as we know that WETH is connected to WBTC, okay, we can compute the value of WBTC compared to WETH. When we have it, we'll then be able to compute the value of all the tokens which is connected, which are connected to WBTC. 
Uh, why are we doing this? Well, it is in order to eliminate as the greater number of unnecessary trades as possible, we need to compute the estimated US dollar or WETH value of each of the tokens of our graph. And we want to remove all the tokens which have no value because they are useless to us. And we are not relying on external data feeds such as CoinGecko, CoinMarketCap. We are do doing this directly from the AMM, okay? So the algorithm works uh, as follows. You, you assume that the value of WETH is equal to one. And while the token value of all tokens is not stable, for each token A, you consider S a pair which contains A and B, okay? And B is a token which has a value, okay? And then we write that the token of the value of A in this pair is equal to the to the incident price of the AMM, okay, which we had here, multiplied by the value of B. And the apparent value of A, okay, amongst all the S is equal to the weighted sum of all the relative values in all the token pairs. Okay. And so th this algorithm, it can be shown to converge. What this means is that when you uh, loop through it at one point in time, its value will not change. And when it has converged, you have an estimated value of all the prices of the tokens which within your graph. And so you can remove the token which value is, the, is inferior to a given threshold. And so this can be used to cleanse 30 to 50 to 60% of all the tokens in your database. Hence, by reducing the complexity and so helping you in your computation by focusing on the passes, on the arbitrage, which have the highest chance of working. Okay. So once we have do, done this, we can get all possible arbitrage with, with a model which is called get, pass, get passes. And here it is a depth first search. Okay. So here we have a breadth. That's first search. So starting with WETH, we wanted to compute the value of the token which were adjacent to it and then going down. But when you want to find a cycle, you do it differently. It's a depth uh, first first search. So here what you do is you go to WETH, then you go to WBTC, then you see what is under WBTC, you go to here Tron, then to USDT. And here you branch into two possibility, either WETH, either you go down to USDC and send to, w, to WETH. So here we are doing the, uh, the search vertically, so in depth, in the, instead of the, doing it in uh, breadth. And so uh, the algorithm works as follows. We construct a, dic a, a dictionary of who is connected with whom, and then at each we use a distributed uh, depth search algorithm in order to find the base WETH base cycle of uh, which are uh, inferior to a given length. And at each level, we apply some checks. So you don't have the right to cross a given contract twice. twice okay. And also, you can implement some constraint to reduce complexity. So, for instance, you don't want more than two balance uh, uh, IMMs within a pass of complexity for, for instance. Okay, and so what is nice here is that uh, you can save base by only saving cycles in one direction. Okay, because with a naive search, you'll save each cycle twice because you can go in this direction, let's say, and also in this direction. But you only need to define one direction, and then you have to compute the arbitrage possibility in both directions. And so this allows you to save some, uh, save some space. And so at the end of the day, we ended up with a data frame of about 15 million pa uh, passes with a maximum comp uh, length of 10. Okay. And associated to this, we could compute a data frame of the passes weights and fees to be used into the optimization. So the weights are the weights within the AMM, within the pairs. So this is, um, this matches the balancer weights. And in the case of, um, and in the case, case of Uniswap, you have ways which are equals to a 50%. Okay. 
up, up, up. Okay, now let's go to the optimization part. Okay. Amazing presentation, so, Bo. You're doing really good. Okay. Follow. When a new block. Uh, thank you. So when a new block uh, arrives, you want to get the balance of all the pairs within your graph in order to have an updated price. And so through this, you'll be able to update the function which gives you the how much each possible cycle yields as a profit. Okay? And so we first define um, a data frame which tells you for each pass how which how many reserve or so how many any tokens of each component of the pairs you have, okay? And then using this, we compute the best arbitrages and save the results to another data frame, which is the ARP data frame. So when we are doing it only with Uniswap V2 or SushiSwap uh, pairs, so at the time V2 also, it was possible to easily derive a closed-ended formula of the optimal input for each path. Because uh, as a matter of fact, Okay, when you have the Uniswap V2 um, swap price formula, okay, um, you can uh, chain all the in all the inputs and outputs of the of the various components of your swap pass, so that the output of the first AMM is the input into the second AMM, etc. And so you can have a closed formula for the output amount of your cycle. So of the chained AMM based in, onto the first input amount. And um, the nice thing about it, it, it is a quadratic. So you can easily have a formula of how much um, you must uh, put in order to optimize profit. But uh, we, when you use balancer, it is not anymore the case, unfortunately. And uh, because here, we don't have a nice chaining effect such as a Uniswap because here what we have is that the um, output of step N of trade N is equal to this formula. Okay, so the reserve of uh, the N pair into the first token, okay, times one minus this, where here you have the output of the last steps times the fees, of course, but to the power here, we have uh, minus gamma uh, to N and gamma, it is the ratio of weights because you remember that the in balancer, okay, so here you had output amount equal to reserve output times something which depends on the input, input amount div divided by the reserve of input. Uh, to the power of the ratios of the weights of the input and output tokens. So with uh, Uniswap V2, the weights are equal. So this simplifies nicely and you can change the formula. But here with Balancer, it is not anymore the case because in the general case, you can have a different weight that for the output token than for the input token. So we don't have the chaining effect and so we don't have the closed formula effect. Okay. But um, yeah. what we see here, is that first uh, get some intuition into the effect is that the derivative of the input is uh, positive. So when you get more input, you get more output, okay, which is logical, but its second derivative is negative, okay, because uh, which means that you have a price impact. So the more input you put into your cycle, the, the smaller the marginal output you get is because you have price impact. And so what we want to find, okay, we want to optimize uh, the input of the cycle minus the input, which is X, okay? And so we want to find the point such that uh, the first derivative is equal to one, okay? And so this maximizes the profit, which is equal to this, okay? But, and we know that this exists because here we have a concave uh, function. So we know that this point exists, okay? And, and the way to do it, basically, it is through Newton's me uh, method, which is a way to do a mathematical uh, uh, convex opti optimization. And here, basically, what you do 
is that you start from some point and you want to find the minimum of uh, some function. So here in this case, we want to find uh, where this function here, okay, crosses uh, zero. Okay. And so the way it works here is that we start from a given point and we iterate by using a first order, order development, okay, uh, so, so that we attempt to find where this function crosses zero. And this this function here that we are optimizing, in fact, is equal to this one, j j prime n of x uh, minus one. Okay, we want to find what when it crosses zero. And so this is done to repeat computation of, uh, of this uh, formula, which allow you to start from a given point and find the next, um, the next point you want to try as being the optimal input. Okay. So here there are two computations which are a bit costly in terms of computation, which are the first derivative and the second derivative. Okay. And what we have done to reduce that, excuse me. What we have done to reduce the um, the complexity is that we use some of the number of paths we are searching upon. Okay. And so at the end of the day, we finish with the data frame of arbitrage, which are ranked by decreasing profitability. With okay, this is a um, the technical point, a mesh between no fee and fee on transfer tokens, because at the time, the fee on transfer tokens, so deflationary tokens or fee which extracted a percentage of the transfer amount at each transfer were very, um, very popular. And so, of course, this breaks havoc into the optimization formula. And so you can have a nice optimization and nice result for standard tokens, but for fee on transfer token, you are always bound to some kind of um, estimation or you have uncertainty about the exact amount you will get. You, will get. you cannot have easily a close a a formula which will, which will give you, which will be the, the output. Okay. And so now what we have obtained, after getting all the possible pairs, after getting the balance of all tokens, within all the pairs, after computing all the possible passes amongst a set of plans and healthy IMM pairs, and after doing the optimization, so finding the most possible cycle among the 15 million possible cycles, what we have obtained is a uh, data frame of all possible arbitrage ranked by decreasing profit profitability. Okay. And so what remains to be done is execution. So, okay, we know what is the, opt the arbitrage we want to do, but it is still a matter of getting this onto the blockchain at the minimal cost, but with the highest uh, success rate. And so this is the drop of the execution mo uh, module. And so at the time, the problem was price gas auction because you didn't have private RPC such as a flashbot. And price gas option as where well the way to compete with other searchers, and this is also relevant today on networks where you don't have uh, RPCs uh, such as uh, flashbots. And so, given an arbitrage, what we do is that first we check, so we do an estimate gas or call, if the arbitrage you know is uh, is profitable. And at the time, there was the possibility to burn gas tokens in order to to have a discount in terms of gas fees. So this has been removed with EIP-1559. And, um, but at the time you had the option within the smart contract to burn some gas tokens, so to free up some storage in order to have a discount in terms of gas usage. And so this was used in order to reduce the transaction fee of your transaction. And of course, your net profit, it is the gross profit of the arbitrage, we, we shoot a, a flash swap, minus the transaction fee. And then you launch it, the transaction into the network, and you begin to check the mempool, and you want to see if you have competitors. And so, and you want to be better than them. And so the way to do it is that you have to always study the blockchain to see if there are other people doing arbitrage, which um, Define who is a competitor, and then you have to see if 
what they are doing is in fact what you attempt to do. Okay, so if they are trying to arbitrage the same pair or the same cycle as you. Okay. And uh, the way to do it is when you detect such a su su such a trait, well, uh, you have two options. Either you raise or you fold. So raising means that uh, you attempt to raise your gas price to go in front of your competitor, because if you have a higher ga gas price, the, then you will go, you will be executed before him into the next block. And so you will get the arbitrage and he will not. And folding is that you cancel your arbitrage in order to minimize your loss. Because of course, only one person will get the arbitrage. And so what happens is that the guy who is uh, losing this auction, so this is why it is called the price gas auction, because you are competing with others uh, in order to get executed first, and the one who pays the highest gas price gets executed. So th the guy who loses, well, he uh, loses money, even if, if he is using flash swap, etc., because there is a cost to canceling a transaction. Okay. And so this brings some interesting, you know, game uh, theory application because, um, well, a possible strategy is that you always raise, for instance, even if it makes you lose money. Because at some point of the time, it may be optimal to fold, so you lose less money by folding than by raising. But the idea of always raising, it is that when uh, the, you are punishing your opponents by preventing them to make any profit and forcing them to take the, the, the loss by folding or having their, their trade not executed. And so when it happens, it, you are losing money yourself in order to make other, your competitors lose money. And so it is the guy who has the deepest pocket who wins. Okay, so this is an interdiction uh, strategy. So you see all your competitors and you reduce the profits to nil or to zero, or even you make it negative in order to drive your competition out of the market. Okay. Very interesting. And so there's something you can do at the smart contract level in order to help you in your uh, endeavors. Because the name of the game here is, um, is to optimize your gas costs, okay? And so there are some, some optimization you can do at this level. And um, first is that you, you always want to check on chain if an arbitrage is still valid, okay? Because sometimes you lose an auction and if you attempt to do the trade by not, uh, not checking it uh, even before, then you will lose more money than if you trade, if you check on chain if the, if the trade is still valid. And if it is not valid, you cancel all execution. So this adds a bit of an upfront cost in terms of gas, but it allows you to um, minimize, to reduce by a factor of 10x how much money you lose when you have a trade which is not executed. A second technique you may use is to obfuscate uh, what you are doing. Because um, competitors, they will interact with you based on what you see, what they think you are doing. So, if, for instance, you put into the call data the um, address of the pairs and the tokens you are interacting with, then obviously it will make they will find it easy to find what you are doing, and so they will know when to bet, when to raise, and when to fold. So they will be able to have some sort of an optimal strategy. So a possibility you can have in order to mess with them is that you, you hide what you are doing, okay? And so they won't be able to do this optimal uh, uh, computation results really simulating the transaction within an uh, EVM. So, and this takes a lot of time, okay? So you make them lose time. And of course, you have got gas optimization uh, techniques. So this is standard stuff. Minimize use, um, so storage usage, use a high run value, minimize external function call. And we went even to down to assembly optimization with custom function selectors, 
minimizing the call data length, uh, etc. And one trick you have, uh, you know, is that the gas cost depends uh, within of the call data of the transaction depends of the number of um, non-nail bytes which make out the transaction in terms of full address in terms of call data. And so when you have a smart contract which has a lot of zeros in it instead of ones or any other number, then it costs a little bit less in terms of gas. So interacting so per byte. Wow, it, it I never costs knew that. Four gas for a zero byte and 16 for non-zero bytes. And so this is what you have a lot of um, TGA smart contracts, which have a lot of zeros into their address. So this is not just uh, random luck. This has been mined. Okay. And and that's it. So, Brother, uh, wow. So, uh, this is me, my company is Cadmos Otayo. We also do some consulting services. Okay. And so uh, this was it. So what we went through is uh, first, the uh, some generalities about the IMM, the mathematical formula to compute the prices, etc. Then how to construct a bot, and we went from the um, constructing of all the possible passes to the opt mathematical optimization in order to obtain the arbitrage, and we finished up with some remarks on the execution uh, on chain. Amazing presentation, bro! Uh, do you Thank have you any so questions? much. Yes, and. I do. I do have a few questions for you. Tell me something. So there's no kind of scam token. How do you deal with those tokens that they get a lot? Because we were talking about keeping the threshold under a certain value, but there are certain honeypot tokens mm -hmm. that they go up crazy in value. You know, how do you manage to keep those? You know, okay. Uh, okay. So this is part of the um, graph sanity al algorithm. Okay. So when we construct the graph of all tokens pair, okay, we inspect, so I didn't speak about it. We inspect each pair and we try to simulate a transaction, okay? So we try to simulate a swap involving the pair and we check uh, if we get, you know, a, a good output. And so we, with this, we can uh, detect the honeypot uh, token and exclude them from our data set. Okay? That's because, very interesting. Uh, a honeypot a token you can you can buy it but you cannot sell it yes and so this it will be excluded but uh by this step here so the application itself has several agents doing different things one is analyzing the main pool one is building the execution chain one is trying the different swaps right yeah exactly and are you guys building your own data structure or you use like some regular database for everything No, no, this is a regular database. So, you know, as a, because we focus on complicated stuff, so a lot of mathematics and uh, low, uh, slow arbitrage, so our reference time was about 10 seconds, we didn't need to go very much low level into the um, database management itself. So basically, all everything was done in Python. Okay, so very we nice. Used some, um, custom, um, stuff in order to uh, store the data into, we hacked a bit the uh, Pandas data frames, but uh, it was enough. And how you guys usually deal with slippage? So you guys are always simulating the transaction for the, I mean, how you deal with slippage, you know, when the, when the chain is, is going nuts, the gas is too high, how you guys deal with that? Okay, so you have two things. Uh, first, you have the slippage, which is a function of how much, uh, which is the size of your trade. Okay, so the most, the the more you trade within a, a single IMM, the worse your price you'll get. And so this is done through the optimization algorithm. So you remember that we optimized some function, which is the result of the arbitrage minus uh, its input. And so this result. Well, uh, it uh, has a negative second derivative. So this means that you have price impact. And so when you optimize it, you find the optimal value, okay, which maximizes your profit, taking slippage into account. And uh, because of balancer, we do not have, you know, any um, 
plot and formula. So we had to use uh, a Newton, Newton method to obtain uh, by computation some sort of optimalish uh, points. So this is regarding the price impact slippage. And also the second part of your question was on the gas fees. Well, here what you obtain is a gross profit, gross of gas fees. So this is the best you can do if you have zero gas, uh, gas fees. And then you need to subtract the estimated gas fees. So we maintain a ledger of this trade, how much we estimate it will be difficult. And with this, depending on the gas price, we can have an estimated net profit. But of course, everything changes when once you get into an auction with a competitor, because then when you have to raise your price, okay, it will reduce your profit. And so at each time you want to assess what you want to do, either to raise or to fold, so to retire from the auction, you compute what would be your net profit and you see, okay, is it optimal to raise? Or is it optimal to fold? Or am I ready really nice. to lose a little bit of money to make the other party lose, lose money? Okay. For instance, on the short run, you might be paying $10 to make the other guy lose $4. So it sounds idiot, you know, but uh, idiotic. But um, if it is enough, you know, to drive him out of the market, then it is worth it. Because when it's gone, then you don't have competition anymore and you have high, a high profit margin. And how do you manage to keep, um, does the bot has any smart contracts deployed or he's only executing functions from the Python code? No, no, of course, because uh, everything is done through a custom smart contract, okay? So the execution is, is done through a custom smart contract, which is highly optimized in terms of gas, okay? So with assembly optimization, and also which uh, obfuscate a bit what it is doing, because you don't want to show to other people what are the pairs. You yeah, are the, yeah. That was my question. Like, how do you hide it? You know, uh, how do you hide the smart contract? No, well, basically, there are ways you can encrypt uh, what you are doing. Okay. So you are not um, passing I understand. directly the address of the, of the token, but an encrypted version of it. Awesome. I have more questions. I don't know. Black Hat, you have a question? Um, I do have questions here from the community. Um, well, hello. I'm uh, doing recently now. And yeah, hello. And yeah. Hello. I wish you were doing well. By the way, you have a question? Mm? I don't uh, know if Black Hat has a no, question. No, no. <laughs> uh, I'm new to this Web3, and by the way, I have a problem in algebra. <laughs> yeah, really. Okay, no in... problem, no problem. Uh, I think a guys has a question. A guys. How's it going, man? All good. Okay, while he's setting up his mic, I have questions from the community. Um, so first question is from Xavier. He's asking how you are updating those 15 million cycles whenever there's a swap on the AMM. How are you finding the most profitable cycle to trade? Doesn't finding the best cycle out of 15 million every time up one new swap or new block takes a lot of time. I think they are constantly doing it, right? Right, NB? How is it going? How are you doing that? How are you keeping the liveness of okay, the, of the so bot? Okay, so this is done... Okay, so what happened is that during each block, okay, we opt we update the pair balances, okay. Based on the pair balances, we extract the um, passes which are impacted by the last pair, uh, price changes. Because, because of course, when you have uh, computed the opti the optimal uh, passes given one state, if there are if there is only one token which price changes, you don't need to do redo the whole computation on everything. You only need to do it where you had the changes. Okay, so you extract the subset of all the 15 million passes which are impacted by by the latest block update, 
And based on this sub subset, which is mu much smaller than the 15 million, you do the optimization. Very which smart. Is, uh, described here. Very smart. Um, another question is from, from our friend Ponetta regarding the profitability is a lot of money will be spent driving the competition away. At the end, is the arbitrage, is the arbitrage profitable? Well, um, depends on, on your competitors, uh, basically. It depends on how deep their pocket, pockets are, okay? And, you know, how um, relentless they are. So if somebody who, is, who, ha who has a lot of money and who is very tough mentally, because at the end of the day, it's also a, a, a psychological Mental game, game, you know? It will take, uh, cost you a lot of money to, yeah, to drive him out. Okay. But uh, sometimes you have people that they abandon after a few days or a few weeks uh, because they can't take it anymore. Because here you have to be relentless, okay? You have to don't let them taste, taste any profit. So you have to always to notice when they try to change their technique a bit, etc. So there was one guy, uh, for instance, he would um, deploy a new contract in order to try to lose me because uh, when he deployed a new, a new contract, I had not yet mapped it as a, as a competitor, so I could not um, know that he was doing arbitrage through it. But it was very tedious for him. So what we done at the time, we automated a, a way and we had people uh, looking at, you know, always on chain whenever the guy would deploy a contract. So he would deploy a contract and then 10 minutes later we would, would uh, find that he had done it. And so after a while he got bored or discouraged and uh, he stopped. But yes, it may cost a lot of money depending on, uh, you know, it's a mental game. And sometimes it may be possible you know, to find an agreement with the with other, with the other guy. Amazing stuff, buddy. This is very, very interesting. Another question here is, how do you usually initiate a transaction? Using flashbots or do you run a, low, a node to have a lower, lower laten latency? No, no, this is, uh, so this is not done uh, through flashbot in this case. So at the time it was done through PGA. So through our own uh, nodes. So obviously with flashbot, the first flashbot, you only have ETH. You don't have, you know, a, there are a lot of chains you don't have. And also you don't have a, a 100% chance of getting executed. This is the second point. And third point, you are also betting a bit blindly. The only advantage of Flashbot is that um, you can um, you don't lose money if you don't get execute, executed. So here, when we are we are doing PGA, it was more optimal to you know have our own node and um, directly launch on chain. Very nice, very yeah. nice. Uh, uh, guys, please go, go with your question. Yeah, hi there. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much for putting this um, uh, presentation together. The question I have um, about optimization, are you using any like half um, for gas optimization? optimization? Um, and the other question I have is, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah okay. in order to be, um, because the, this um, um, space is, a very high competition. So, what do, where do you see, like, if someone is wanna be uh, successful in this, what skills they need to have, and what how they can have edge? Because there's a lot of competition out there. A lot of people, as you mentioned, the people with the money, they use always the, um, they can use the gas. But how like the normal people like us, how the, how can we we be better in, in terms of technology? In terms of where do you think that we should do more? We should focus more. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so first, regarding gas optimization, yes, it's a very important part, especially when you do press gas option. So when you are working with a very fast algorithm or when you are working through flashbots, it is much less important. Okay. But in this setup, gas optimization is critical. And so what was done within the smart contract is uh, we went down up to assembly optimization. So instead of using native solidity, we rewrote the functions in assembly. We even overwrote the function selector in order to optimize a few, a few gas points. So it was very highly uh, optimized. Okay, so for instance, easy stuff you can do 
is you don't use storage, you optimize the contract to get IR, etc. You min minimize external function calls. You can also have unchecked computation, etc. And then you can use assembly. And uh, you can re rewrite the call data to take less place. So, for instance, you know, uh, an Ethereum address it takes 20 bytes, but it is stored in 32 bytes. So you have uh, 12 bytes which are wasted. So the way to do it is that you can have in assembly, you can manually extract the data and so reduce the size of call data. So this is the first part of the question. And the second part, you know, there are two types of MEV. Basically, you have uh, what is called a low tail MEV. So MEV, all, you know, everybody, everybody knows about, which is high volume, such as a sandwiching, it, and which is very competitive. And you have long tail uh, MEV, which is MEV, which is mar much more specialized. So what I would advise is that you find where your edge is. Maybe it's mathematical, maybe it's in IT, maybe you can have, you know, a better understanding of a very niche and complex protocol. And you start from a given niche. So you don't want to start out, you know, in competition with uh, Jared from a subway because he will just obliter obliterate you. But so what you can do is that you find some sort of a niche on a side chain and you work out the inner details of a, a complex protocol. And there, the compli the, you, you will have no, no to none uh, competition, basically. Okay? And so you can start from there. Excellent, excellent. Thanks, thanks. Because you know, big actors they will not, uh, you know, bother themselves to extract a few hundred dollars of MEV you know, per day. Okay. Awesome stuff, bro. Awesome stuff. I have a follow up question from, from our friend here, Savior, saying Are you storing a map with token address to cycle containing that token? Sorry. Are you storing a map? With token address to cycle containing that token address to find all those cycles that need to be recalculated. Uh, so, uh, so what we do, we have basically when you have all the cycle, it's pretty easy to find all the cycle which contain a given token. So you can e either you store it or you have an algorithm which allows you to find it. Awesome, awesome. And I have another question here from F is how many people are working in this operation? And, and if you can't disclose, feel free to, to not say it, okay? I don't know. This, um, this was um, not much. It was a two-person operation, uh, a side project. Very interesting, very interesting. I don't know. Do you guys have more questions? If you're typing, please be fast um so another question here from cinderblock do you take in account trade activity on centralized exchange if there's a if there's a huge order on a particular pair uh, this is only amm arbitrage we don't interact with uh, centralized exchanges in this case yeah you it's... have other you know other strategy where you will integrate with uh, with centralized exchanges, but it is out of the scope of this particular strategy. Another question. Right, I have another question. Uh, Go on. Thank you. I think I have another question. Uh, thanks. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, you mentioned we all know it, the competition is very high. So, will you recommend someone to start like a solo searcher, or you will recommend to start joining a team? Because there's a lot of things. Um, so, being a solo searcher, you have to do a lot of things because yeah, as you have. And back in your presentation, there's a lot of steps you need to build. So being in a one person, it will be difficult. And so do you think that you should join, you should join a team or be a solo searcher? Thank you. Well, I think that if you are motivate, motivated enough, I would advise you to be a single searcher because you can own all the stack from top to bottom. And of course, it's complicated. Of course, you need to develop transversal competences, but this is what you, where you will grow the most as an individual, you know. Mm. And this is also where you get all, all your own profit and you have to, uh, um, you ha and you decide upon everything because, you know, all, with a team, you always have, uh, 
you first have to develop trust. You have to develop how specialized you are. So either you have to work with the people you are very close to, or I think the best thing is to um, begin a, as a single searcher, even if afterwards you want to join a team because you know, ev every part is related to the other parts. So in order to have a good algorithm, you need to understand everything uh, from top, top to bottom. Yeah, because you have interdependency. Yeah, there's a lot of data analytics. I mean, lately, I mean, um, it's they're using a lot of machine learning, data learning, artificial intelligence. That's the in, the new game. I mean, that's where I mean the things are heading. I mean, there's a lot of data analytics, so you need to wear multiple hats. Not only um, the crypto part, but you also have to learn data analysis, data analytics, the algorithms you need to define mm. because the high frequency trading. Technology is coming to uh, a crypto meth. Um, is, yeah, that's actually where the market's heading because they are bringing. Because there's a lot of high frequency traders. I mean, big guys with the big money are coming to this, and and they have all kind of uh, yeah. skilled people. So it'll be very difficult as a solo searcher to compete with them. That's the point I'm making here. Yeah. Makes a lot of sense. Uh, it's difficult, but you know, you know, nothing is easy in life. You know. Yeah. 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 Very good point, Thanks. by the way. Uh, I have another question from from Savior, which is that there's any tricks to finding a niche uh, of you know MEV, because we're always using the classic stuff, right? Compounded, of Uniswap, maybe some lending, uh, some futures. Well, you know, this is the thing. If it is easy to find a niche, and it it is not a niche anymore. Because everybody knows about good, it. Good, good one. No? Good one. So it's like a bit, a, a bit of an oxymor oxymoron. But um, you know, I would focus on starting with maybe second tier protocols. Understand how they work. Uh, in uh, you know, you open DeFi Lama, you see where there are transactions, where there is value on protocols which are non-standard. Maybe on chains which are not so popular. And and uh, you try to understand how it works from a computing point of view, from an IT point of view, but also from a financial point of view. And this is how you can uh, find ways to uh, to generate uh, new new arbitrage. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. Can I can I put something here? So I I don't know if this counts as AMM or arbitrage, but I had a bot in the past that made me some money. What he would do is he would scan mm -hmm. the Binance network to see which DEXs are being deployed. So once a DEX was deployed, he would be looking for whenever the MasterChef contract was deployed in the DEX because that contract was deploying the DEX tokens for the farms and everything. And every time developers will fuck up the parameters and pay too much. So you could buy, stick the tokens and make like, 50% of the pool, you know, in, in 24 hours until they fix the hates, you know, but that was gone, mm -hmm. uh, you know, but I think this, would this count as, as AMM? Uh, it, it, it is a way to, to arbitrage it. Uh, it's not, you are arbitraging another property, which is not the trade price per se, but the uh, incentive to, to be a LP. But yes, it's a clever way to, um, to find MEV. MEV. Amazing. So, uh, and so is, it is, it, is it still live? No, not at all. Uh, but you can try. Uh, you can you can still try this technique. You know, I think it's still gonna work for some chains. Um, um. So I have another question here. Is I'm good with maths and computer science. How long will it take for me to create an MEV bot? Uh, um. How long it will take for you to take to, go, to create an MEV bot? Consider there is a very good developer uh, depending on and knows math. No, no. So depending on exactly what you want to to do, okay, and how complex and your competition. But uh, such a project, uh, depending also if you already have some code uh, working, you are good with uh, cloud computing, etc. But I think, yes, you could you have to set aside uh, at least two months of work. 
in order to have you know, some first actionable results. Awesome. Maybe so, not something which gives you a profit, but two months is full time, you have an idea of uh, where you are. Awesome. Well, last question now, guys, because we, we need to release our friend and be here. Okay. What does the future in this space look like and from where we are right now? But I, I, I cannot speak for, uh, for the space, but obviously what you had is that you have a market which becomes more and, and more professional with, with more and more efficient uh, algorithm. So clearly for low tail or very popular strategy, what you have is a concentration uh, of factors. So you have the more, most sophisticated and powerful actors which are getting a bigger and bigger share uh, of the market. And so there was a question about it uh, a bit earlier, but the market is, be is becoming more and more professional because at the beginning, AMM back running, you were able to do it directly from your script into your backyard, uh, speaking with Uniswap router. And now you have to have your own node. You have to do a lot of stuff. And um, the more time passes, you know, the higher the barriers to, to entry are. So if you want to, to get in, sooner is better than, uh, than later. Amazing, brother. Thank you so much. This was incredible. You know, I hardly see people so excited making questions all the time like that. So this was really cool. You have any closing thoughts? Any final message to people that will hear or see this on YouTube? No, no. Thank you so much for uh, your invitation. Feel free to contact me if so now you have uh, my Discord. I'd be happy to jump at, uh, on one to one chats uh, if you want. Amazing. Thank you so much, brother. And this is it, guys. Talk to you later.